Welcome to Breeder Syndicate 2.0, where we explore the history of a clandestine scene, researching everything from cannabis strain history, old smuggling tales from the first person perspective, to breeding science and news on current subculture. I'm your host, Matthew, and I'll occasionally be joined by my homie Nato Dog, breeder and grower from Mendocino, to speak on these subjects and sometimes interview other participants. Our goal is to document this history before it's written by corporations and others who just weren't there. Let's start writing some wrongs. Welcome to the underground. All right, All right welcome to Reader Syndicate. I'm Matthew. This is Not So Dog. Today we're going to talk about the state of cannabis. Uh, we we try to do this every now and then to kind of update on what's going on, not only with the legal market, but how that's affecting the uh, traditional market. I believe is a proper term that the the youngins are using these days. Um, so yeah, uh, let's kick it off. Not to dog. Let's talk about some of the legal things going on today uh, in cannabis and how it's affecting uh, everything and from your perspective. Um, well, I mean, I think it it's affecting everything. Certainly, there's. I don't think there is a part of the cannabis scene from extracts to seeds to flour or anything like that that hasn't been affected by it. Um, and I think honestly, it is, um, it's been primarily negative. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, maybe you could say, especially for California, because, you know, some of these other states, it might be their first time that they got like stores. Um, but you know, California has had, um, you know, medical shops and stuff like that, basically full fledged dispensaries for a long time. Well, now when you say negative, who are we speaking about? Like, who is it affecting negatively? Is it affecting... The consumer affect uh, negatively right this second. Is it going to affect? I actually think future? it's affecting everyone negatively. I, I think so too, but I, I don't know that everyone will realize the effect. So, instantly. I mean, I don't know if if, if you want to start from the consumer and go up. Sure. I think for a lot of consumers, um, choice has gone down. Mm -hmm. Quality has certainly dropped significantly, um, and. Uh, Price has gone up. But, bro, I'm getting my cookies. But, but you think price has gone up, really, though? Like, hasn't the price on the pounds dropped? Or is it legal market, has it gone up? For the consumer? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so we're not talking, that's what I said. We'll start with the consumer. Yeah. Like, if, if you go, if you're, if you're, uh, if you, if you're buying, you know, eighths and ounces or something like that, you know, if you're going into Are shops. They paying the same price or more. I think I think they're paying more. Yeah, I'm just so out of the loop on that part. Well, they're paying more yeah. because when you go and you you know, there's all these built in taxes that there didn't yeah. used to oh, be. Yeah, that's right. Before all the laws, yeah. there's excise taxes, there's these taxes, there's all these different things. I mean, people sometimes on IG will post these receipts mm -hmm. and they'll show I've like, Oh, those. I just yeah, bought yeah. three seventy dollar eights <laughs> and then you add up the taxes and the excise and the this and the that and everything else plus the sales and it's like this crazy component of it right yeah um you know i also think too that like all these mylars mm -hmm. that most and what i mean by mylar for people listening i think most people know but like a lot of a lot of cannabis these days is sold in opaque mylar bags yeah which means that you're looking at it and you get to see what the strain name is and you get to see what the packaging and the art they chose is but very often you don't even get to see the cannabis you're buying until you've left the building. Definitely not smell. So you don't get to smell it. You don't get to touch it. You don't get to view it. Yeah. And so it's sort of like, uh, you know, you, you just get to see the art and the things that they've chosen. Now, you know, there's some exceptions. There's people that are, you know, there's, there's some things where they're visible. There's some people that are selling them in jars and stuff like that. But for the most part, you don't get to see it. Sure. You know, and so I think the taxes have made it um, to where I, I would bet on average people are paying more at the shop than they are than they were under 215. Oh, yeah, I would bet. There we go. You know, and I don't think the choices are as as, you know, as diverse. I wouldn't think so. I just wonder if if they won, if they care, I guess they as long as the prices are high, they probably do care. I think the more prices drop um, on the consumer end, the less they would care because the prices are lower. And I, I, don't, I just know. don't know that they've Maybe. been top quality. 
Well, it's, it's, I mean, you know, you can say that people wouldn't care, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like, I, I mean, I guess you could walk like, you know, to use an alcohol perspective, you could walk into the store and be like, I am glad that the Bud Light is getting cheaper by the case, but I wish that there was maybe some other brands. Sure. Yeah. It makes sense. You know? And so I, you know, I think what happened is personally is I think that when they made these rules, they looked at like what the black market price or the traditional market price or the medical price or whatever you mm -hmm. want, whatever you want to phrase it as was and they based a bunch of taxes and fees off of that price yeah not realizing that as soon as you expanded supply by a ton you were going to change the pricing of all that dramatically so and taxes are too high for the consumer taxes are too high for the distro taxes are too high for the um you know for the uh uh for the farmer right yeah and i don't think that I don't, I don't think yet that the states care, you know, because, uh, what's really happening is, is they get so many taxes and they get so much fees up front, especially local, like municipalities and counties and all that. Like they get yeah. so many, they get so much up front just for the right to do it, that it's not like normal taxes should be, I'm making money off when you make a sale. Yeah. Not having to pay up front for all the ability to surveil you and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's like you start adding in all these, you start adding in all these fees and taxes and, and revenue boosters into yeah. a new industry. And what it's basically done is it's made qual it's, it's made quality a lot harder to come by. Oh, for sure. For I mean, there's, sure. There, I'm seeing stories. You probably are too, Matt. I'm seeing stories like in California of just like how many, um, cultivation licenses are not being renewed for the 2023 season. Yeah, and that, that's got to scare them a little bit. You know, they may not have, have seen the effect immediately again because they were getting the money from, you know, the 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 right to be able to grow. What are they, the licenses and all that shit? Well, you like, can look at it. You can look at it in a, in a different way. I mean, I think I'm not a very big fan of Proposition 64 for California specifically. And I don't yeah, want to get no. too California yeah, specific sure. because I'm sure yeah. there's a bunch of people in other states that like have different rules. But one of the things that happened is, you know, when we all voted on this thing that we were supposed to, they were supposed to, for the first five years, you weren't supposed to grow more than an acre or say 43,500 square feet for the first, from 2018 to 2023. Yeah. And that was supposed to allow legacy farmers um, a toehold to have them have years to establish distro and dispensary and all these different relationships before big companies came in. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, Steve D'Angelo and Harborside and very other lobbying groups, <clears throat> they didn't want to wait that long. They wanted to dominate. And so they got a workaround where you couldn't have more than an acre. That's still true. Yeah. Because <clears throat> that's part of the law, but you can stack as many 10,000 square foot licenses as your county will allow you or your city will allow you to. Okay. And so what happened there is that what they would have found, in my opinion, if they would have forced it to just be an acre or less, mm -hmm. you would have had all these legacy brands. Sure. And you would have discovered that with the amount of stores that they have, the legacy brands were more than capable of filling the current demand. Yeah. And since all these legacy brands would have been a lot more, a lot smaller and a lot more diverse in size, their quality probably would have been a lot better hitting the shelves. But what they did is they allowed certain counties like in Monterey and Salinas and in Santa Barbara and different areas to blow up and have dozens or hundreds even of light of 10,000 square foot licenses. Yeah. And they got, you know, and when you look at the, when you look at the fees for some of these things, some of these, some of these farms are paying, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to over a million dollars a year, just in, just in license fees. So the state and the counties, they get all that money up front. Yeah. And then there's way, way too much weed being produced. At, I have a quick question. Yeah. Tangent, but quick question. How is Harborside producing all that stuff in Arizona for so long that everybody knew about? 
Was that there I don't way? know. Is there I, some way they were moving it in? No, I mean they. As far as I know, Harborside had a. Uh, I think it was like you know ten or eleven acres or something like that. It was a pretty big greenhouse facility. I mean, it's in, publicly known, right? Somewhere, somewhere in Salinas. Oh, or oh maybe I'm not talking about Salinas. the Arizona. Do you remember the Arizona stuff? I do, but I don't. I don't have any inside information on that. Yeah, I don't so either. I'm really just wondering. Comment. Yeah. <clears throat> but you know, there there's basically what what happened is is there was any number of rich people and their children especially. Yeah. who were like, "Ooh, this is a new massively profitable industry and I'm going to help my family dominate it." Yeah. And kind of what's happened, this is actually maybe this is like a little subversive or for me to say or whatever. Ooh. But but really what's happened is most of the biggest investors and the biggest companies I've just been lighting a bunch of money on fire. Mm, that's true. Like they thought they were going to burn through all this money, but at the end of the day, they would have a dominant market position. And then they would recoup that over time. As a poor person, I look at that and I think, oh, those rich people thought they were rich enough to play with the richer people. Well, the other way you could look at it, and I'm no. not, you know, I'm, I'm no, big, no, I'm not, yeah. It, I'm not Explain naming names or whatever, but you could say that there was a industry-wide thing, and this is not everyone, so don't take offense if you're one of these people, or maybe you should, I don't know. It depends yeah, yeah. on who you are. But when the money first came into cannabis, a lot of traditional cannabis people who had had to hide for a long time and stay low, and they didn't really deal with that type of sharky rich person, stayed low. Yeah. And a lot of the people that were really interested in rep and getting rich and being flashy, they were the first people to run towards the money. For sure. And so what happened sure. is, is a lot of money made a lot of bad deals with a lot of people that weren't able to actually do what they said they were going to do. Yeah, it was a bunch of people that acted like they were connected and knew some shit, but weren't and didn't. I mean that we saw that nonstop in every single facility we've ever been to. Yeah, I mean, and you a can lot say, of it when people people would hire us to consult, it would be to fix the errors of the knuckleheads that came before us, the chads that came before us that were like, "Yeah, we know what to do." You know, you saw yeah, so and, much. And so you know, you have a situation now where um, it's like a state of the union or whatever. But you like if you're on IG or you follow like uh, marijuana news or anything like that. You're seeing reports all the time of now of like almost daily or weekly of pissed off investors who all their all their investment money has been blown and they're wondering what the hell's happening. Uh-huh. You know, like in my neck of the woods, I mean it was this big thing where like Flocana, you know, they raised two hundred and fifty million dollars or something. Yeah. And then a few months ago they shuttered operations. <sighs> And so I think those guys, the, you know, they dealt with some pretty sharky investors, yeah, you know, um, who were probably not the greatest people to deal with. But then the investors are like, okay, well, we're going to kick you out. We're going to take it all over. And then they're like, here. And I'm like, oh, what are we taking over? There's no money. Yeah. You know, and what it turns out is, is that as long as we're going to be this situation where we're not federally legal and we're only state legal then every state technically, legally, is supposed to be its own little island. Yes. Which means that it can only, you can't, out, you can't send your excess anywhere but these highly regulated channels. Yeah. And nobody ever figured out like how much output or how to like, how to give out the, you know, how to give out licenses. And since licenses had a ton of upfront money and fees and costs involved, Mm -hmm. they just granted them and took a bunch of the money yeah and they made it really really hard for most of these peace places to survive so what you have is you have the people that are best at growing cannabis say like the people in my area in mendo or you know southern humble yeah. people that have been growing for a long time outdoor or light depth or you have people that are really quality indoor farmers or whatever and they're pushed in all these different directions just to survive so they can't actually bring their full craft knowledge to bear because they're having to make choices based on surviving, right? Yeah. And then you've got these huge companies that are just burning through other people's money 
that are producing B and C grade cannabis and then dumping that um, anywhere they can just to stay afloat. And how much do you think the uh, hemp market played into it? The hemp market? The hemp market played into the THC market and the over overflow. Oh, well, I mean, I, I think that... Uh, Let's talk, you know, I mean, really, I mean, like, it's the so, state of shit. So, <laughs> before we get into hemp, I'll just say this. What happened is, is that um, there's <laughs> way too much cannabis being grown in California. Yeah. Way too much, way too much outdoor, way too much. There's, there's so many 300, 500, 800 lighters, you know, all these huge scenes that are banging stuff out. And there's, and what's weird is that like, you look at Canada and Canada every year destroys large amounts of unsold legal cannabis. Yep. So far in America, all, all of ours just disappears. <laughs> what the fuck? You know, just disappear. <laughs> so what happens is, is that there's not enough demand to, um, you know, to, you know, there's way more supply than there is demand. The state mm -hmm. doesn't want to admit failure. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of, the, let's just say that the line between the legal market and the traditional market is more of a, it's more of a shadow than a line. Yeah. I, I'd say it's that's very a permeable. Statement. Yeah. So we got we had a, a brief technical difficulty, but um, wherever I was talking about I, the the line between legal and traditional is more of a <clears throat> is more of a shadow than a firm line. You know, and so no one wants the 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 state doesn't want to address the fact that they've way allowed overproduction to prolifer to, to proliferate, right? Yeah. And so what happens is, is that a lot of this stuff is getting diverted. But it is. diverted. Diverted into the traditional market. Diverted into the traditional market is flooding that and, and taking out what would be future potential competitors for rich folk. And. One of the Everyone things awesome that annoy, used to annoy me is like when I'd smoke weed with friends and the dab revolution was happening. I'm like, you know, this this torch thing is really not relaxing. <laughs> like it just took a really nice hit, you know, and I'm like, yeah. oh, happy. And then it's all. <laughs> it was too it was too tweaky for me because I remember back in the day, like tweakers used to have to make their own pipes and stuff. And they do that with blow torches and shit. And I used to hate that. Like, it would just be a nasty. Uh, and so when I would see people like light up dab rigs, it would just bring back bad memories of that shit. So, of course, when we just start bullshitting about nothing in particular, it's I'm coming through crystal clear. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And then I start trying to chat and then we like lose it or whatever. So that's yeah. that's fun. Well, well, let's go ahead and keep going. <clears throat> okay. Right. So I don't know exactly where we got cut off, but uh, I, I what I think is happening is I think that the state doesn't want to admit that it's allowed far too much production to occur. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's nowhere for that production to go within the regulated channels or not enough of it. And they don't really know how to have a system where people have poured in all this money, probably without getting sued, of yeah. how to pick and choose winners and losers of who can continue and who can't. And they probably don't want to admit that they created a system that's failed. But what happened is, is because we're not allowed to do interstate commerce, our overproduction isn't allowed to go anywhere. Yeah. Legally, that is. So I mean, what happened? Huh? Don't you? I, I mean, from just from my point of view, the way I look at it, and you know, I have this really like super nihilistic, like, point of view on everything that's very dark maybe but like i i thought that was like from my point of view all done intentionally with the knowledge like that they it's very easy for them to predict how to crash a market and how to like how to sink because they can afford to lose money for x amount of years because they're used but to who's doing this they? business and they is any any corporate entity of these major corporate entities that are buying in no you know, like a W what's the one that, that, that UFC and all that stuff they've got, they've got interest in cannabis. That I don't, I don't UFC. believe, I don't believe that's true. I, I agree with you. 
okay. and that I had my suspicions. And I do think that there are some people out there, <clears throat> glass house, that um, <laughs> is, is intending on burning through investor money in the hopes that the market opens up and then they're positioned to service a much wider part of the American people than they currently are. See, the way I'm saying it is, is not necessarily so mysterious. It's in business, like the idea is the richest people that are going into a business in a new commodity, they know that they can outlast taking losses longer than the other ones. Oh, I get what you're so saying. So they drive the price down or they drive the price up. No one can compete or drive it down. No one can compete because they can't afford to sell at that price. Then they drive artificially because it was artificially right. driven down. That is true. Up. Now However, they control the whole market and everybody's gone. What they're discovering is, is that too many different disparate rich people tr were trying to do that. Yeah, that's what I was trying and to get you to really get to. ended up doing was lighting their money on fire. That's right. They got too greedy. And sometimes some of these people like are now tired and like they're, they're you're so look at it from like a rich person's perspective, right? Mm -hmm. They want to put their money into something that gives them a rate of return. Yeah. And they got bamboozled into thinking that like weed was going to be this, oh my God, it's going to be three times the size of alcohol. This is going to be an $80 billion industry. We're going to get into the ground floor. My son, who's kind of been a ne'er-do-well his whole life, I'm going to be able to like gift him at the ground level, this amazing thing. <laughs> uh -huh. And, you know, he's going to stop being a disappointment. Right? Yeah. You know, I think, I think a lot of it may be that sure. But I think a lot of people predicted there there was going to be a lot of that. Well, see here. So here's, maybe we could take, maybe we could take a, a different step back. Sure. Be, and because this explains a lot of it where, um, because it's, because it's still federally illegal, mm -hmm. the feds have decided to some degree where if as long as it's within a state they're not really going to apply it because the state is sovereign and can do what it wants yeah so that like i said that makes each state its own little island yeah which makes it unique in business because there's almost nothing else in america where you're confined by whatever business you're doing to the state that you're in fireworks and that's it that i can think of you know, maybe like, maybe you need to get like a law license or like a real estate license. But when it comes to like goods, for the most mm -hmm. part, there's nothing where you're like, oh, this good can't cross state lines. It can only be in California or it can only be in Wyoming or it can only be in Arizona. Fireworks. Right. So fireworks. So down to dude is you have to realize that like rich people want a rate of return on their investment. Mm -hmm. And so far, cannabis has been a terrible investment in which many, many, many big investors are not even getting their principal back. Yeah. Much less profit on their principal. Sure. Right. So no rich people want to like light their money on fire or like, you know, shoot it down a tube and never see it again. Yeah. So they got into it where they thought, oh, I can get into this industry. I can get into this marketplace. We can be in at the ground floor. I can get a big amount of market share and we can get in early and I'm going to make gads of money. And this is where, like, I keep saying, like, they treated it like any commodity. Right. And but they ran it wasn't into like this. any commodity. No, it's, it's, it's not. Unique. It's unique. It's so unique and so different. It's yeah. not federally legal. And so that what that means is that, like, if it was federally legal, we could ship it to whatever other states we wanted to that wanted to allow it. Yeah. You know, we could send our excess to places, which means every single state that's set, that's gotten set up has gotten new investors jumping in, hoping to make a bunch of money before there's competition for them. Yeah. And they're all bumping into the same thing. I mean, I was talking about it before with Flo Connor or whatever. Mm -hmm. You really think those people wanted to light 250 million on fire? Yeah, I can't imagine. And, and after, were... after you pour that amount of money That's in, that you decide to stop touching cannabis and you shutter most of the operations as you try to retool and figure out what you want to do. Yeah, that's not a good look. No. Did you see that thing? Like it was on, it was on IG, and it was in the news. Um, you know where there's investors that are hella angry at, at uh, Emerald. I think it's Emerald Family Farms from oh, no. uh, from uh, Humboldt, where they got an eighteen or a nineteen million dollar uh, reinvestment, and the guy absconded and changed his number, and the investors haven't received a penny of their principal back. Shocking. You know, I mean, I don't know. You went, I'm not, you went I, crypto with it. 
I'm just, well, you know, I'm not, there's like, not <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know any details of it either, but yeah, there's yeah, investors, yeah. there's investors that are now suing various executives of cookie. Oh, that's angry, funny. angry at, you know, all kinds of various practices, but probably I saw that. I saw that. What, what was the one that they were saying? That it was about I mean, they're, they're basically saying that they got diluted. Okay. And that certain executives, uh, a couple of them were pretty famous. Okay. Um, we're getting kickbacks, side deals, okay. and all that type of stuff. And obviously, like if you're running on investor money, they don't want you making side deals. Yeah, yeah, no, because it's all you know public, and yeah, well, it's not your money. That. Yeah, you can't be it's doing like, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so and so, who knows if it's true or not? But we've yeah, entered in we like yeah. Uh, that that's not what I'm saying, and I don't have any inside information on that. But what I'm saying is. Mm -hmm. is that, you know, you can look around at these stories that are coming out, whether it's Flo Connor, Emerald Family Farms, or Cookies, or whatever, where people that were investing a bunch of money in 2018, 2019, 2020, with big hopes and dreams of having a bunch of market share and, and making a lot of money off their investment, are now worried that they're not even going to get their investment money back. Yeah. Much less profit. And they so, thought they were going to come in swinging. Yeah, they thought they were going to take it over. Yeah. And so one of the things I was trying to say before we had some uh, technical glitches is that because it's still federally illegal, um, you know, most big banks are multinational banks, you know, or they mm -hmm. operate and they don't want big fines and they don't want trouble with the federal government. Yeah. Which Obviously. means so far that cannabis businesses have been, they've had a, cannabis businesses actually have a really hard time even getting banking. You know, I, I can, I can throw something in here. That's very recent that I learned, um, uh, with seed banks recently, there is a, uh, attitude seed bank opened up in the USA. A lot of people know about this and they were able to secure credit card processing. However, um, their competitors were trying to do the same thing and they were told major problems. It's not even consistent. Problems. No. Well, I mean, typically what happens too is, you know, like um, a bank will find out that a cannabis company is a cannabis company because they're not all named like Emerald Emerald Farms or something. Sure. Some of them are named like the most benign sounding LLC something, imaginable. Something T-shirts. Yeah. yeah. You know, in order to get around that. Yeah. And then they literally shut you down because they don't want fines from the federal government. They don't want. Because they're federally you know, insured. They they don't want any trouble from the federal government because they're trying to stay compliant. Yes. Right. So what that means is that they're very intent upon not having a bunch of uh, traditional cannabis black market money flow in to the legal system. They wanted it to be above board and they wanted it to be legal. Yeah. The problem is, is that we don't have really government banks in this country. All these banks are private. Which means mm. that like the government can't of California or whoever can't order the bank to treat this industry like a normal business if it sees liability for itself. Yeah. So <clears throat> you and I can't go into a, into a bank with a business idea and a prospectus and a, you know, and get a loan. Yeah. We can't go to ag credit. We can't go to chase or, or Wells Fargo or, you know, J, you know, any of these big companies, you can't go to them and do that. Right. Yeah. But they want you to use banked money. Always. So what does that mean? That means that you're dealing with private individuals, you know, or funds that collect rich people's banked money. Right. Which yeah, means this that is, that's huh? why I always go back to no matter if no matter what, those people were never going to win because they were never rich enough to compete with the William Morris company and all these other major but organizations. These They're major organizations. Win. They haven't even really jumped in all that much yet because it's not like they want to jump in when it's when like, I honestly think that you can look around at some of these big companies like, you know, whatever cookies or jungle boys sure. or somebody like that. Right. They're hoping when they go federally legal, I would guess that some big corporation like Nabisco or William Morris or, you know, absolute some sure. big company comes in and just buys them. I'm sure. Yeah, that's what they're hoping for, because honestly, so far, the super large companies that can really throw their weight around, 
cannabis is too small fry for them yet. It's not international. There's too many barriers to trade. There's too many regulations. There's too many restrictions. It's too new. They don't want to throw math. They might be prepping for what's eventually going to happen. Sure. Yeah, we already know that. But I, but that I don't doesn't know mean that they would buy in under their names. They always buy in under subsidiaries anyways. We wouldn't really have a, a very good idea of who's buying into what because they don't ever do that. Well, they I buy just, in as their name, you know. So far, they're all so smart, right? So what it looks like is that a bunch of the private investors so far looks like they're going to lose their ass. Yes, heavily. They're going to heavily <laughs> lose their ass, yeah. you know? And so they might be waiting for like it to actually go more legal. And then they can they come could, in and yeah. buy things for pennies that have a lot of infrastructure in place. And I think some of these big, they, people call them MSOs, multi-state organizations. I think a lot of these MSOs, both the executives and the private investors that are involved in them, their whole business model is to get big enough and attractive enough that someone eventually comes along and gobbles them up and yeah. everybody makes a bunch of money based on their stock position. Yeah, I think that's... They're, that's that's the idea of like a lot of like how I shouldn't say the average person when they start a business, I think that's the mindset is that they hope they get big enough to get bought out by someone bigger. I think that's a lot of the small business mindset. A lot of people don't have the mindset of the long game. I mean, you know, it, so, you know, and I think that's the investors thing, you know, they're looking at that's how they're going to get paid back. Sure is this big buyout and everybody gets a certain amount per share. Yeah. And then it comes in a big chunk, you know? And so some of these invest, some of these businesses are always after fresh batches of private investment. Mm -hmm. And like the most devastating thing for them ever would be the status quo. It reminds me of the internet bubble so much, just, just the way we're speaking about it. Like the, the, the internet bubble of the, the two thousands, you know? Oh yeah. I mean? like, like this thing where it's like, Oh, Yahoo's worth 480, 480 bucks a exactly. share. And then eventually somebody goes, well, how do they actually make money? Yep. Yeah. And Artific someone's like, where's artificial. all the money? Where's yeah. the revenue? You know? And it's like, yeah. you can have certain businesses, strangely enough, for market share that keep losing money, but gaining market share. Like, you know, Amazon would be the primary example. Oh, yeah. Where they grew themselves with losses. But they were actually gobbling up market share and, and destroying local malls and changing how consumers shopped. Yeah, they right? changed how business was done in that in that way. They changed how they changed literally and the internet came along with them and people yeah. could all of a sudden shop in their underwear. And you know, so that beautiful. model can that model can work, mm. you know, but it's not working for weed. And so I think now you're in this position where we're in California, we're five years into legalization and all of a sudden the stuff you start to see a lot of is anger and lawsuits and recriminations and firing of executives and all these different things going on because where's the money? Yeah. Who's making money? No one. Not that I, mean, I can see, see. Like when you, when you talk to people and you and I both talk to a lot of people all up and down you want to call it the industry on both sides. Yeah. You know, who tells you, you know, you don't even have to say who they are. Is anyone telling you, oh, we're making money hand over fist. Couldn't be happier. No. And it, it seems like the only people that could be making money are the, the, is the taxes making money, which, and I don't see that necessarily. I don't see like public social stuff benefiting widely from well, um, taxes aren't making revenue. money. Taxes are skimming off other people's money. Well, that's what I'm saying, but it's the only guaranteed money that that has come in are the taxes. You know? you know, taxes and fees and all this different stuff. Yeah. And so a lot of times these investors were promised whatever they needed to get promised so that these people could get the money. Yeah. And they'd figure it out later. And then there's some of these people, some of the people that are winning is like some of these executives that borrow that borrowed a bunch of money. Had that last test. I don't know. We've had enough technical difficulties this week now that I do feel a little thrown off my my jibber jabber game. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, <clears throat> on top of all the legal stuff, there was some news today that kind of hit the scene that that was a little wacky. And I, uh, the general consensus when I posted the the article, 
was uh, not not positive from our community, the the traditional market, I would say, generally speaking, that responds to what I post. And it was about California giving twenty two million dollars, I believe it was, or there thereabouts to um, it was either six or sixteen universities um, to conduct research on legacy strains. And the response from pretty much everyone was resoundingly like, how, what, how are they going to do legacy anything when they haven't, you know, talked to anyone in the community? I know my, I'm, I'm super biased and opinionated about this, but I'm really interested since, since you hadn't heard about it or seen it yet to, to hear your thoughts. Uh, well, I don't, you know, I didn't actually hear about it because I was otherwise occupied today until yeah. you told me right before we kind of started the show. I do think, you know, it's a needed thing uh, in the sense that they should start taking interest into the genetic history and the diversity and the different types of plants that are out there. Their problem that they're going to face probably is the same problem that they face like with making things legal is like since we don't have any like accreditation and there's no way for them to like vet us yeah how do they choose who should be on the board because as you as I, as you as I, and I know right like without naming any names and getting anybody mad at us or anything like that um you know there is a lot of popular people that actually aren't that in depth yeah and so you start talking about like well who should be the per people talking about history oh my gosh would you probably get a big debate on who is allowed in and who people trust and who people don't trust okay let me read this to you real quick so you can get a better yep. idea me getting closer because i am blind the california department of cannabis control the dcc awarded 20 million in research grants to 16 academic institutions the funds will support scientific research on the impact of cannabis on the mental health of young people, novel cannabinoids, and Delta-8 and Delta-10 THC, and a first-of-its-kind study of California's legacy cannabis genetics intended to preserve the history, value, and diversity of the communities that steward them. It is the department's aspiration that these studies will advance the body of scientific research, further our understanding of cannabis, and aid to the continued development and refinement of the legal framework said Rasha Salama, Chief Deputy Director at DCC. Call me! Uh, these studies will provide valuable insights on topics of interest to California's consumers, businesses, and policymakers, and the department looks forward to sharing them once they are completed. Researchers at the University of California, San Diego, will build on the existing federally funded uh, project to provide California-specific data on the impact of cannabinoids on mental health, physical health during adolescence, yada, yada, yada. I was more interested in the... Um, in the legacy part, but they don't really go much more into that. And yeah. So after hearing more, anything change there? Well, uh, it's about as vague as humanly possible. Sure. Yeah. Except for the fact that, um, you know, they're going to look at effects on children. Yes. And which Delta makes and 10. Well, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Because, um, you know, anytime you make rules, there's obviously going to be a series of people that are going to try to work their way around rules. Yeah, sure. And mm -hmm. I don't think they anticipated when they passed the farm bill that had the hemp part to it, <laughs> that people were going to extract these things, Delta 8 and Delta yeah. 10, because they it. only had regulations banning Delta 9 THC. Yeah. Delta so 9, what happens, a specific kind of Delta 9 THC at that. Yeah. So what happens is, 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 is various entrepreneurs discover that they can pull out these possibly psychoactive chemicals or, you know, or compounds or whatever from hemp, mm -hmm. right? And hemp isn't regulated that way. And neither are these compounds. And all of a sudden it appears at your local gas station. Yeah. Right. It's way Delta eight and Delta 10 probably have way more places that they're sold than, everywhere here. Yeah. Then, then cannabis, because cannabis 
so far they've created so many rules and regulations. It's like it, it costs an arm and a leg just to have a store. And there's zero regulations on this stuff right now. And, and that's there's why zero regulations. Yeah. And so I'm sure with zero regulations, that's giving kids a lot more access to it. I do fear the um, the kid thing, yeah, specifically sure. because typically kids are very sympathetic, right? And uh, nobody in the legal market or traditional market is really advocating for a bunch of kid use. Yeah, no. Not right? at all. Um, whatsoever. So, you know, um, I do think that I don't think you should ban things that adults enjoy in order to protect children. I agree. You know, but, all you know, the way that things that could hurt children um, possibly or could have a negative impact on them don't get regulated is, is the industry is big and powerful and rich and has a bunch of lobbyists and they make sure that they keep their grubby hands off their stuff. Cannabis doesn't have that. Cannabis yeah. doesn't actually have big business. But to me, like the, the, the legacy strain part is the part that really like grinds my gears because like, like just even looking at, at the idea of it is like now they want to take a look at the legacy strains. Hey, let's get let's get a hold of some of these stewards over in some of these uh, locations in California. Oh, you mean the ones that don't fucking grow anymore because they can't afford to? They had to toss out their mother room because they were driven out by the corporate shit these guys well, are all supporting? That's the way I look at it. Matt didn't want me to talk about this because he says we talk about it all the time. <laughs> uh, but I'll bring it up again. Do it, that, do it. Fine, fine. You must. Is, is that you know, I am quite fear fearful of legacy strains, both in seed and clone form surviving, because it was always a small group of people that cared about holding on to things that weren't currently popular. Yeah. Right. The vast majority of the cannabis industry only wants to grow things that people want in the moment. Most people, even within our community, don't care very much about legacy unless that legacy makes them money. So it was already a, a, a small subset of a small subset, right? Yeah. And the issue is, is that that small subset used to be able to use what was a fairly lucrative industry to fund their little passion project, which yeah. might be keeping rare clones from back in the day that had a popularity once that aren't very popular right now or rare seed lines or, you know, I mean, Matt can talk about, you know, like our buddy CSI or him or others where they make things that are commercially viable, but then they also have passion projects on the side where they might get some old lines or some rare stuff or some weird sativas that probably aren't commercially viable. Yeah. But they might do an open pollination or they might do a preservation project just to keep those seeds fresh. Yeah. And see what's going on with them. And But what that takes is that takes someone caring and having enough time and excess money to be able to fund that little passion project. Yeah. So if they're going to stretch everybody out and everyone's going to be hanging on by a thread, it's going to make those little passion projects. It's going to make things that aren't currently feasible much harder to achieve. Yeah. I think um, this, it sounds like resoundingly after talking to not just our, you know, our friends, but people at other seed banks and around uh, the community, it sounds like this uh, 420 was pretty miserable sales wise in the seed market. More probably the worst one yet um, in the years that it, that it passed. So yeah, definitely like the legacy. The legacy stuff's going to be growing tighter and tighter and tighter because it was the that kind of stuff that was not moving at all. I mean, Matt can talk about this more than I can, but. You know, we used to have like a lot of times the Emerald Cup or like the High Times Cups or these various gatherings. Um, not only they were nominally a, an awards ceremony, and it, but really what they kind of were was they were a way to sell hundreds of booths to all kinds of different vendors. Yeah. And those vendors could come and with a fee and booth space and whatever else they could hawk their wares, whatever those wares might be. Yeah. Um, and that was actually probably the economic driver that pushed most of these events. Big time right? for a long time. Yeah. Because, it was the main thing. because it was a, it was a way 
for you know producers of seeds or flowers or topicals or extracts or you know what or whatever edible whatever the case may be to get in front of customers yeah and you could go see and you could maybe even talk to your heroes or you could complain to someone in person or whatever it might be and um you know that fueled a lot of small businesses that had a very wide and very diverse interest range yeah so you could go and talk to matt and you know he's interested in you know uh you know blue lines and weird afghans and different types of stuff like that and you could go talk to somebody else that was interested in mostly in old school humboldt and mendo genetics and you could talk to somebody else that was mostly interested in purples or yeah you know the, that one year in uh, uh emerald cut me and csi were literally booth to booth with ncga net right next to me it was a really weird situation so you could talk to three of the the older guys right there right there yeah nice. and people yeah. could get and a lot of times it was like people wanted to buy seed and so you know when when the industry had more money sloshing around in it a bunch of people would come to those events with with cash in their pocket intending on talking to people directly which wasn't always easy and then making yeah. purchasing decisions after those chats it was a traditionally outlaw market. It was it, like, I mean, that was a, uh, uh, started out as a harvest festival. So it was a lot of the, the outlaw market that would bring their outlaw money, you know, like this was it's how it ran. And, and they would buy their seeds for that whole next year that they wanted to run. And it, it was a, it was something that happened and it, it fueled a, it fueled a lot of what was the Emerald Triangle at that time. Yeah. And it, it fueled a lot of individuality. It fueled a lot of, you know, it basically made the scene very diffuse. Yeah, I was able you, to grow some chocolate ties and grow those yeah, lines. You could, you could, there were, you know, all of a sudden, and, you know, Matt will joke, you know, that like, you know, we talked about it, how like 90% of the seed companies probably have sprung up within the last 10 years. Oh, yeah. That sure. in that environment that allowed them to do a bunch of shows and IG allowing them to like announce drops and do business through there allowed them to communicate with a lot of various weed people, small and large, and connect to their customers. And it developed a pretty robust thing. Yeah. And the more robust it became, the more people got interested in jumping into it. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like one of those things where like you get into real estate or something during a boom time and you've never experienced high interest rates or a depression. Yeah. So the whole time you've been in business, it's just booming. And, and there's a with, lot of people, right? With seeds, with seeds, like it's, everybody can make seeds. It's not hard to make seeds. It's, it's hard to do selections and, and pre do predictive breeding, you know, but it's not hard to make seeds. So it's like. It is kind of hard to sell a house in that way. Like it's not easy to sell. Anybody can make seeds. Like anybody can do it their first time super easy with the male and a female. And so, so it anybody allowed a lot of that small market. people to like dabble in it as an excess stream of income. Yeah. But that also allowed some people to pursue their passions or their interests. Yep. And then find people that shared those interests and sell beans to them. Yeah. Well, now what's happened with the legality of everything is that all those booths there, they all have to be licensed people. It's now they've now, now, but, but before the whole thing was sort of like some kind of like gray area swap meet. Yeah. Now they have little segments of like, oh, here's the legacy brands. Yeah. Here's the little section of people that probably can't afford to be here, but it's used, it used to be all the people you came to see. <laughs> yeah. So we'll like, we'll like make this little section for them and we'll make them have a space because you're tired of going and seeing all of the big corporate funded brands yeah, that have a bunch of money behind them. And none of them really have any little passion projects. What they want is like market share and money. And so a lot of those in the legacy brands, you would go in there and you'd see they'd have like a plant there and you could talk to them. But there was zero seed sales. They were not allowed to do any seed sales if they weren't licensed by the state. So oh, I mean, I remember there. You know, yeah, there was, there was people, there was times when, uh, you know, I would do random stuff. Like I would go to like, you know, I'll just, just off the top of my head. I went to like the, the swamp boys once, you know? Yeah. And I, sw I smelled their mojito mm -hmm. and I was like, Oh, that was a cool jar. I'll take a pack. Yeah. There was, there was, there, there was some nose in there that I was like, Oh, well, okay. 
it was like yeah. to, you know but it's like unless you have unless you have samples and unless you have herb and unless you have people that can like you know smell it or smoke it or see it or talk to the person they might not know it exists or might not know it cares yeah you know and so what happens is is that a lot of the people that started making seeds and started making names and started making companies for themselves are locked out of that yeah so it's like the very people that built those scenes up into making people willing to buy expensive tickets and bring money in their pocket to drop and allow those those you know those uh you know those uh high times or emerald cup or whatever to sell expensive booth space right like that mm -hmm. all collapses because you need people with money you know the last year the very last year that i went to emerald cup the only way i was allowed to go there was to go there via a seed bank that was registered right like and and had licenses somehow all that crap and um I was allowed to interact with the customers, but I wasn't allowed to do any direct seed sales. So they'd come to me excited to buy these packs for me. And I'd be like, eh, mm, got to go there. Sorry. And it would just well, yeah, and, upset I mean, people it, so much that they couldn't just do that. They have that exchange. You, you had to, it's almost like you were there to promote, yeah. but like you had to have a seed bank there that had all the proper licensing and all the proper hoops and all the proper everything. And, you know, before at some place like that, you know, Matt or any number of our buddies would show up with a trunk full of seeds and brochures and all kinds of stuff. And in the new rules, it's like the distributor has to bring it all. Yeah. I, so, I used to show up with stuff, piles of stuff to give away, and I couldn't even do that. You know what I mean? I, they would, I wouldn't even allow to give stuff away. So they created all these new rules and they created all these regulations and they created all these fees and taxes. And it made them a good, it made revenue and, and, in, in terms of like, you know, state fees and taxes that they got. But then a few years went by and now who knows what they're going to think because all of a sudden they're like reaping what they sowed and they're realizing they didn't actually set up an industry that's thriving. Yeah. You can't have an industry that's thriving that the only way it's thriving is you give away more of your business to more investors to stay afloat for longer. That's not. And so what happens is, is when that happens, you know, especially when you get investors in there, uh, the problem is, is since investors don't come from weed, all of the cool little side projects, all of the neat little stuff, all of the ways that you would treat cannabis in order to make it really, really high quality, they start looking at that as costly and inefficient. Yeah. And they want to return on their investment. And then you're not going to make any money at your company unless you give them a return. On, like you have to pay out all this money. And if you want money left over for you, people start trying to figure out like it's what happened in Colorado when like everyone was like, oh, I need to get three or four pounds of light. Yeah. The most important thing is getting three or four pounds of light because that's the only way I'm going to get a paycheck. And that's the only way the investors are going to start breathing out, you know, stop, stop hunting me. And what that meant is that all these consumers then are going to get all these strains that yield that much and we're pumped that much and we're grown at super high EC and super high CO2 and super everything to like make them yield like crazy. And they're like, man, this isn't as nice. Yeah. But you know, the economic model is like, we want, we want to return on our investment and the people that took the investment money are like, I need to get paid. And so What's happened is, is you took a sort of like, I mean, what's funny is like Dennis Perone made the, made the first, you know, medical law in the, in the country with 215 in yeah. California. And it was very loose and it was very gray area. And it I, you know what, can we, can we just say thank you, Dennis Perone? Like, what, oh, 100%. what an awesome dude. What an awesome and dude. And he a, and made it for great the representative, great, great, well, a great representative of the gay community for yeah. cannabis too. And he, he he's made it for the, the consumers. Cannabis. He made yeah. it for the sick patients. Yeah. He made it for people that need, you know, especially people, you know, in his community that were, you know, HIV positive and struggling with all of the various uh, ailments that come along with that, especially in an era when, you know, when he was pushing for it before they really even had effective medicines yeah. uh, to treat it like they do today. And he made it very loose and sort of gray area ish. And out of that came a 20 year boom. Yeah of economic activity that revolutionized 
the state and in, in a large way and spread all across the country. I wish I had the picture ready right now. Maybe I can find it. But I have a picture of Dennis Perone in the late 70s. And if, just for the strain nerds that watch this, like that really, really didn't know this, he's sitting there with bowls of like every exotic cannabis strain you could imagine from around the world in 1978. Like the biggest G on earth had somehow, like he had access to what we have today, like somehow back then in 1978, sitting there in his little San Francisco shop, you know, all the different tie sticks and Afghans. And the, it, it was wild. So yeah, the man amazes me and I'd like to do an episode on him. I mean, he's, he's definitely, um, and so you take him who basically did this thing that not only helped a bunch of sick people, yeah. but also began to change America's viewpoint on what they thought was both harmful and dangerous you know into something that people now mostly think is fairly benign and actually positive and kind yeah and then you know we make proposition 64 and five years into it uh the whole thing is in crisis <laughs> yeah it's just a weird it's in shit. total it's crisis minutes. there's nobody yeah. in any aspect of the of the weed game that's particularly happy yeah you know, um, where I mean, before... yeah, we even we even have D'Angelo upset about sixty four now, which is uh, really ironic. You well, know, I don't think was, it's ironic. To me, he was like he was one of the, to me again. I keep going back to this, and I know I'm gonna sound like I'm ranting a little bit, but I go back to the he was one of the people that thought, hey, I'm I'm freaking wealthy. I'm richer than all these dope heads. I'll come here and take this. I, you know, a little bit of a culture vulture, in my opinion, just my opinion, allegedly a culture vulture. You know, he thought he was rich enough, and then he found out, ah, oh, shit, I'm not rich enough. Everybody, I mean, I, shit. I have a, I, have, I, you know, I don't usually talk poorly about people. Matt always tries me to get me to do so. Um, but even, even back in the day, in, in the height of the 215 era, um, mm -hmm. he wanted the most important part of the cannabis chain to be the stores. Yeah. He wanted the most profitable place to be the stores. He yeah. was always trying to cut off growers and producers and hash makers at the knees. Yeah. Um, he wanted to buy what he could from them as cheap as possible. And he wanted to be the central player. And he is not the only person, but he is a large reason. Um, he pushed Proposition 64 very hard. And, Lobby. I think that, and he money. was very big on being the father of legal cannabis and all this, that, and everything else. And the reason why he's changed his tune now is because he realizes, I think, that the thing that he pushed for is a disaster in a large amount of times. And he doesn't want to get blamed for it. And he didn't, and he even, I think he even got pushed out from his own company eventually. He did. Uh, yeah. Over time. <laughs> and that wasn't what he was intending on either. I think he was intending on ending up being very rich. Yeah. And also getting to do nice Time Magazine pieces on being the father of modern cannabis. Mm -hmm. He thought he was going to be some combination of Dennis Perone, Bob Marley, Willie Nelson. He was going to be... Snoop Dogg, all Snoop, of it. Yeah, he was going to be an old, well-regarded legend. People were going to stand up and clap when he went into the room. He was going to weed for warriors. He was going to you know, do that same thing when you're a corporate raider where you do a little bit of charity so people can pay to talk good about you. And, you know, he ended up just killing the goose with the golden egg. You know, um, this is one thing I've noticed in the Discord with a lot of the people. Because we, we're starting to get, like, a big community in our in our Patreon Discord, right? Like, it started very small and kind of cozy. And there were a lot of people really tight. It started getting, you know, a little bit bigger and bigger. And as more people come in, we start getting a newer crowd. People newer to growing. A little bit on the outside reach just getting into growing. And somehow they're finding out about us. And they get really, really shocked when they hear that, you know, like certain people like Steve D'Angelo may not grow in his basement or Snoop Dogg doesn't have all these grows and tables in his rooms pumping bubblegum cookies, right? Like this isn't yeah. happening. And it really this, but it's not common sense to everyone. It's, it's common sense to us as growers that, of course, of course, these people that travel around and do all this shit aren't growing and don't have mobs. Why would they? They can't. Yeah, I mean, people might think this is funny, but Matt and I talk all the time about, like, what to talk about. 
because yeah. some stuff might be like in our in our mind might be beaten to death by us. Oh yeah, but might not be well known or understood by the larger populace yet, or might just be important enough, like the state of the cannabis spot, spot that you kind of periodically just talk about it yeah. because you got to keep battering it in. And, you know, eventually what happens is, is that, you know, consumers need to force choice. And what large companies want to do is they want to give you the illusion of choice while making a ton of money off you. Yeah. Right. And cannabis is very unique in that, like if we were going to, I, I use this analogy a lot, but if we were going to go into, say, like the supermarket, almost everything you buy in the supermarket, um, if the vegetable or the fruit doesn't meet the production model, it doesn't mm -hmm. get grown. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, um, tomatoes aren't rated based on their flavor and their texture. They're rated based on weight and color and does their skin split and do they rot and can I pick it green weeks early and ship it across the country and then ripen it and then sell it. Yeah. So like the consumer is way far down the list and cannabis is unique in that no one ever would choose to grow OG Kush in a production model. Yeah. No. They just wouldn't. No one would choose to grow OG KB or cookies in a production model. You know, there's lots of strains that have gotten famous that from a production standpoint and from an ease of growth standpoint aren't very desirable, but maybe their flavor or their effect or just the customers like them. Yeah. Right. And so as a result of that, you know, um, you know, people are getting into this business and they're like, well, I want to grow, you know, we think, you know, like. They want to grow something that just knocks it out of the park. They want it to be the biggest. They want it to be fastest. They want more, more crops a year. They want more yield. And if they can just force consumers to take the things that fit within their production model, they will. Yeah. And so consumers have to fight for choices, right? And right but now... If, we're if kind of consumers aren't educated about their choices in the first place, like what's out there then that's how stuff gets lost in my opinion sure and, of and it's super hard to edu to educate people just coming in how do you ever get past the initial a lot of those people's initial point are the snoop dog are the steve d'angelo the jim belushi show or any of those things that's yeah, it well these how do you get so them here what's happened is with you know mike tyson i'm not even dissing it the only person I'm dissing that he just mentioned is probably is uh, Steve D'Angelo, but uh, the rest of them, it's like, they're just famous in other aspects of their life. Maybe yeah. you're an actor, maybe you're a musician, maybe you're a, a, a famous boxer, maybe you're whatever. And you already have people sure. that think well of you. And so often what they do is they license their name and their image and they kick them some money and some whatever for doing it. And then they, they're trying to make a brand. They're trying to make familiarity with people out there. Yeah. But what most people are realizing is that most of these brands are really just buying from third parties. Yeah, it's a, and it might they might be all the same thing. I mean, I don't know. I don't. Most people probably don't know that for all the cookie stores, cookies barely but doesn't touch weed. <laughs> they, they don't. They make mylars and they make clothing. And they, and almost all of their growing is third party grows that they make contracts with and they get a right of first refusal. Yeah. Right. They can choose whether or not they want to buy it or, you know, or not based on whatever contract they arrange with that person. But people yeah. think that like burner is out there and like, they've got a team of like excellent growers that have been knocking this stuff out and refining their craft for the last 15 years. They really do. But they don't, this, but they do. They do not have that. That's not what they do. No. That's not their model at all. You know, their model is to get third parties to, I mean, even when it comes to breeding and stuff like that, you know, they worked with JBZ for a while. They worked with Chris Compound. They were, <laughs> they, they hire out, they farm out almost all of their work. Let's, let's, but let's not confuse people because realistically, like that farming out doesn't just stop at the person, you know, in many cases, like, 
cookies will farm out to someone else to make the seeds, and that person might farm out to someone else to make the seeds. Like, very, there's oh, several yeah, very much so. middlemen in the middle of this without naming anyone. There's so many middlemen in the middle of this. It's not even funny. Right. It's like they get a yeah. contract, and they're like, hey, I'm going to make this amount. Yeah. I'm willing to give you this percentage of my amount for you to do all the work. Yes. Exactly. I've got the contract. I've got the outlet. I've got the sale. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to do the work. So how about you do all the work yes. and I'll give you a piece of it, but you can't do, you can't get this deal without me. Cause I have the deal. Yes. Right. And so he's right. There's usually multiple layers at times of farming it out. Hypothetically, like if there was a, a company named Schmookies and one name, um, impound or outhouse and they're like hey will you make my seeds they're like yeah but yeah i'll make those seeds and then like they don't even let them know and they're like hey more down here hey uh little guy hey can you make the seeds yeah i'll, I'll give you x amount Pfft, kick it up bang i'm a breeder i mean that's been going on in the seed game for a long time yeah you know and you know i mean that's not even for me to like cookies is like a clothing brand and it's stores Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and they, but they want most, they don't really have like QC in the way you would think where it's like, they don't do all that stuff in house because that affects their ability to become multi-state operators in some way. Technically uh, they are a seed company though. They I mean, did I guess release they, candy rain, didn't they? They did kind of release candy rain, I suppose. But as yeah. we know, and we don't have to name names, they farmed out the making of candy rain to a third party. Yes. Yes. And that third party made them. And then they put them in, they put it in their packaging, just like they might, whatever, you know, whatever it might be, biscotti or cheetah piss or this or that or whatever, they're going to put it in their branded mylar. Yeah. But like the people growing it aren't on their payroll. Yeah. You know, they contracted it out. So a lot of these big brands don't actually they're not actually vertical in the sense that they control their own quality. Yeah. It'd be like if, you know, I don't know if like Gucci was actually like getting all of their stuff from like, you know, there's like, you know, seven different Chinese sweatshops and they didn't <laughs> actually have any like quality control or anything like yeah, that, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, I mean, it, but it, that's, that's, that's the state of it. That is and the so they don't want, it. they don't want people to know that. Because it, 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 you know, I mean, I, you know, we used to joke that 10 years ago or whatever, you know, people thought that like their cookies was like hand watered by burner, <laughs> you know, For like real? in the Bay when it was really first coming out that like all the cookies that was there was like from four or five different dudes all carefully curating it and making it happen. Yeah. And they were early on to realize that like the brand was the thing. And they could farm out the work and still make a big percentage for being the guy. Yeah, I think they were very early on at figuring out that everything was a brand. Branding was everything. Everything was a brand. Yeah. And weed speaking wasn't of, ready for that. Huh? Speaking of that, have you, have you ever seen one of these things in action? Have you ever seen this real quick? No. This is what they call an ash it ashtray. And I, oh, I, I heard don't it. Yeah, I yeah. heard it before we it, started. It, it, Suck the bowl clean. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try it. We'll see. I don't know. Let's see. This is uh one of the C2 glass ones, but I it I can't always get it to work. Oh, there it goes. I guess it had to take a second. Hold on. It's so loud, isn't it? It's it very non-relaxing. Um yeah, I don't maybe maybe I need to, to love it to get a better suck. I'm not sure. Um I don't know if you can see, but the it like sucked around, but the center's still there. <laughs> Oh, well, okay. That was worth a try. I tried it. Yeah, uh, that's a terrible yeah, sound. It's not yeah. how I, that's not the sound I want to hear when I'm yeah. trying to relax and smoke some cannabis. That's for sure. No, I, I wouldn't mind if it did a good job, but that did not work very well. Okay. I had to try it. I don't know. You had to try it. I had to try it. <laughs> okay. Now let's get back to where you were. That wasn't obnoxious as, uh, as all hell. That was a little obnoxious. Yeah, I don't... Yeah, I didn't know it was going to be that loud, loud, loud. Yeah, it's like very high RPM. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Right next to the microphone, too. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, I... Like, the to the state of the affairs, it's kind of like... 
what's happened in a nutshell is there's vast overproduction in almost every state that gets recreational, right? It mm -hmm. happens fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, and then the glut leads to price wars where stores and distributors start purchasing things based on pricing and margins for themselves, which leads to a lack of choice for consumers because they don't get to pick amongst the quality because the distros and the stores are buying things that are most advantageous for them. Yeah. And being like, you know, here's 28 kinds of, you know, these boofy to decent and a couple things that randomly are nice, mm -hmm. but they're all in Mylar, so you can't see it. So hopefully you guess which one's good and I'll take your money. Yeah. Right. And then what happens is, is that you hear all this talk, this might be pretty political or whatever, but you hear all this talk about how the black market or the traditional market is affecting the legal market and the legal market would have a lot better sales and be a lot more robust if yeah. we just didn't have all of this black market or all of this traditional market or medical market demand going on, which is hamstringing our new legal industry. Yeah. And it, they mostly blame it on cartel black market specifically. And, I mean, whatever you want to say. Well, they just try to inter intertwine that propaganda is the same thing. And it just, yeah. So this might get me in trouble, but um, I think, I think it's actually reversed. Yes, I so, do too. So, and what I mean by that is that I think that it's very true that the white market people, um, would all like all of the black market producers to stop. Yep. And they, they, they want the supply of the black market to stop, but that's not because they think that there would be hordes of new people pouring into the stores that would robustly boost up their white market sales. Mm -hmm. It's so that they can take their excess and dump it into the market share that was formerly being supplied by the traditional. Yeah. And I think what happened in California is the first couple of years as this overproduction problem happened, there was a lot of diversion that people didn't, people don't want to admit that metric is both cumbersome, expensive, and super ineffective. Yeah. Like it's an open secret in the industry how poorly metric works at keeping things where it's supposed to be kept. <laughs> poorly that, porous. You know, we don't need to get into the, the who porous. And yeah. it's not, and, and, and anyone that wants to can get around it. Sure. And so most large and medium sized companies um, that aren't legacy and aren't fairly small end up having to divert a decent portion of what they make into the black. Yeah. And that worked for a few years until production and overproduction got to a point where they started having difficulty doing that. Mm -hmm. And so their complaints that the black market is messing them up isn't about their white market sales. Yeah. It's about their traditional diversionary sales. Yeah. In my opinion. No, no, it makes sense. Yeah. Because what they want is they want the tr traditional supply to go away so that the traditional demand is more robust for them to supply. Yeah. Because obviously because otherwise, the smokers I mean, will this, keep being smokers. I mean, there's this thing that like, you know, Matt and I were looking at not long ago where like this past year, Canada, which has gone totally legal they destroyed like 425 million grams of unsold cannabis that had expired, which was 28% of the yearly crop that yeah. had been produced in the past 12 months. And I think that worked out to like, what was it like nine? I don't even, it was like 916 tons or something. It was like, it was, a, it yeah. was an enormous amount, whatever anyone who wants to do the math. I'm like, you can look it up. You know, Canada destroys 425 million grams or something. And so they actually, what that means for Canada though, is that means whatever system Canada has, they're actually preventing a large, uh, at least that amount of it from being diverted. And then it's sitting mm -hmm. there and then it eventually it gets old and expires and then they light it on fire and get rid of it. Yep. I haven't heard, maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't heard of a single recreational state that has had to step in and destroy a bunch of expired cannabis products of any kind. 
I, I don't know of any. I, I hear of a lot of people sitting on a lot of stuff, but I don't know if that's even, I don't know what market that is when I hear that. You know, but there should be, maybe, maybe there's not, I mean, there's eventually there's rules where it's probably too old. Yeah. You know, and so I'm not even trying to call people out or anything like that. They're just trying to like, they get into business, they set up a 500 lighter, you know, and all of a sudden they realize that, you know, they're growing seven, 800 pounds a rip five times a year. And there's not enough demand with all the other indoors going around for them to off all of their product into the white. There's just not. And, you so know, I mean, means- I think a lot of it too, like, I mean, a, a big portion of it started because it was, it was people in the, the white, like the, the people with the financing talking to the very first people in cannabis that they meet who could be any Tom, Dick or Harry there that has the balls to say that they have run X amount of lights that hasn't run any light. Cause I mean, realistically, how many guys, uh, pre two fifteen were running, you know, hundred lighters, but how many people well, stuck up their hands and said, I, I can run that. I mean, how, there's a bunch of people that that's stuck up their problem. hand and said, I can run five acres. Yeah. That's a major fucking problem. You know, though. I, like, I know how to run. I know how to run a crew of 70. And, and like I said, that's a major problem. And, and that's, that almost reaches to the disconnect that I've been speaking about with the the legacy strains and and the universities is that there's still that disconnect. There's that disconnect between the people with the money or financing or the people with the science that are writing the history books and the traditional market that's done this all along because everybody's trying to work everybody. You know, in between the middlemen are all trying to get between and work between the two and these two have never spoken. I really feel like there's very little communication that's ever gone on without these these shifty ass middlemen. But well, if you want, if me. you want, yeah, if you want to take a a like a a free market approach, you know, to it. Yeah, right? Dennis Perone's version was l- very lightly regulated, the yeah. light touch of government, and let you know human ingenuity and commerce build. Yeah. And the legal situation has been, in my opinion, legal is actually the wrong word. It's more like highly taxed, highly regulated, very controlled. And as a result of that, they've created so many different barriers and so many different inefficiencies that you have these people that are exploiting all these different inefficiencies. And so you go in and you can go in states from gluts where nobody can make any money and the price of cannabis falls below the cost of production to, you know, droughts where it spikes briefly, you know, and people are getting crazy dollars for different things because it's all volatile. And then, you know, it's just not, it's not open and fair. And so as a result of that, you know, there's like, I think there's like 40 million people in California. I don't, is there, I don't even think there's a thousand legal stores. Yeah, I have no clue. And as you know, like you're in a different part of California than I am. There's all kinds of counties, especially in the eastern part of California, that have mm-hmm. banned dispensaries anyway. Yeah, like I don't think we have any here. It has to be outside Dis- our county. Dispenser- dispensaries are mostly a coastal county phenomenon. Yeah. All the way from San Diego up to Humboldt. If your county touches the ocean, you probably have a dispensary. And if your county yeah. is, is along or east of the five... You probably don't. Yeah, that's pretty much it, huh? You know, so you give all these people that have opt-outed where it's like, so like they allowed massive production to take place because they collected all this upfront money and then they restricted the hell out of where it could be sold. So you have a glut and you give a lot of power to the dispensaries and a lot of power to the distros. Yeah. Right, where before distros didn't even need to exist a farmer could go directly to a dispensary and they could make a deal yeah you're right yeah. now you have to have another middleman now you have to have in california you have to have a spe- special delivery license if i'm a farmer and i want to drive my product to a dispensary i have to have a delivery license otherwise it's not legal for me to have it on the road it's, even uh, it's, if it was okay. grown on my own farm it's only it's only legal on my property. I can't. I mean, as kids, right? We we watched the movie Robin Hood, Disney movie Robin Hood, 
and we all saw King John, or you know, or no, the sheriff of Nottingham. Yep. And we all knew that motherfucker would come around and tax people for their money. And even his kids, we knew that doesn't make any sense. That's not that man's money. Give that man his money back. But as adults, we've all made this invisible agreement that this is okay. The shakedown that's going on is cool. And well, maybe it's just my punk rock ethos. Like it's your, it's your, it's, that's your punk down, rock ethos. I think I a lot of people choose what I get shook down by where that money goes. Five years ago, I think there was a lot of people that despite their reservations in, in, in 64, were yeah. like, you know, this could suck in a variety of ways, but at mm -hmm. least I'll be able to make a living, support my family, put my money in the bank, never get raided. <laughs> <laughs> right. My kids won't yeah. ever, I will, you know, nobody will know what a go bag is. Yeah. Um, you know, and for people that oh, don't yeah. know up here, a go bag used to be, you would have a bag packed with a bunch of stuff, yeah. essentials for you or maybe your family and your family would know that like, if you got raided, go run into the woods and hide. Yeah. Grab your the go money. Bag is gonna, go hard. Your go bag is going to get you to the neighbors or it's going to allow you to survive for a day or two until they leave and you can come back safely. Yeah. You know, and there was a bunch of people that didn't want that stress and they were like, okay, well, this deal seems kind of crappy, but at least I'll be able to legally support my family, put my money in the bank and just have a normal business. That's fair. And a lot of these people had PTSD, like real. Yeah genuine ptsd from being raided and having their family's lives upturned it so sucks fair. yeah i can tell you it sucks it's an occupational yeah. hazard you know yeah. if you're a, if you're a minor maybe you get black lung if you're an office worker <laughs> maybe you get carpal tunnel you yeah, know if right. you're a if, if you're a rug layer or a roofer maybe you blow out your back or have a herniated disc you know if if you were a cannabis farmer even if you were like fully fully legal and selling all of your product to a dispensary just like 215 intended and all that yeah yeah could still hit you and be like you're going to jail yeah they don't care yeah and that matter. doesn't mean that you might not win in court but you still got raided and went to jail and your plants are all gone and, and your you're and you gone, got cut down and they took what they wanted and now you're fighting it out and so you know people thought initially but what's happened now is it's like you know, it's gone on long enough where that's the reason why a lot of these, a lot of these, um, you know, up here in my area, four or five years ago, people used to sell cannabis properties at a premium. Yeah. Like, oh my God, look at this ranch. It's fully developed. It's turnkey. turnkey. It's got all this yeah. grow on it. You can come in and you can make, you know, you have a turnkey business. And yep. now you see a bunch of these same properties and they're like way less. Oh my God. Because... You know, a lot of times it's like it's a losing money proposition. Yeah. They took something that took a ton of Californians and a ton of rural areas and brought them out of poverty and created an enormous amount of economic activity, both in the rural areas and in the cities. Mm -hmm. And they somehow, like I said before, they killed the goose that laid the golden egg. And nobody well, wants to free. admit, nobody wants to admit that they made a bunch of mistakes and how they're going to redo it. But what's going to happen in the next couple of years is I think they're going to, you're going to see like this thing has been propped up by a bunch of investor money getting poured into it. Yeah. And when that investor money stops, right, which it's starting to stop because when you start seeing investors start suing people, it's because they've realized they've given up hope that they're going to, now they're worried about their principal investment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When they go from like, oh, I'm going to make a ton of money. Yeah. To now like, they're worried about, I'm going to try to recoup what I can. I'm going to try to recoup, you know, I'm going to try to mitigate my losses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And so as a result of that, if that's the case, then you're going to see a bunch of contraction. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, it. uh I think most people, if you ask most smokers that have been around, that at least have been smoking since, say, like 2008, they would probably tell you they preferred the stores in the 215 era. Oh, yeah. As yeah. far as quality and diversity of what they had access to. Yeah. I mean, the, just the things you could do. Like, you could, in 215 era, you could run a breeding project in, like, your freaking dispensary. Like it didn't, 
You know what I mean? Well, the other but thing you, that I could you could say... also get popped. Like you could get popped that day, but everybody knew. Like okay, you get popped. We, everybody bails out real quick. A week later, run your shit and you're back. And then another six months, you do the same shit. Everybody. Maybe knew. I should make a political statement. Do it. I like. In my statement. opinion, like the biggest thing that. You know, you were talking about that article and like studying Delta 8 and Delta 10 and THC mm -hmm. and harm to children or whatever and and legacy strains. The biggest thing they could do for legacy strains, they don't need some $20 million university study program. Mm -hmm. They could just make it be like, OK, if you're if you want to be non-commercial cannabis. Right. I don't care if you have a breeding pro program with 200 plants in your backyard. Yeah. Now, the reason why they're scared to do that is because they're scared that you're going to grow 200 five pound plants and grow, you know, uh, a, a literal, th you know, you're going to grow a thousand pounds of weed and you're going to sell it on the black market and you're going to make a ton of money and how they're going to differentiate. Yeah. But if you look at like the heirloom vegetables like Baker Creek or any of those people, right? The reason why all those heirloom vegetables survived was because there was a bunch of enthusiasts they were able to breed and grow and trade seeds and trade cultivars and do all this stuff with zero government care or regulation. And without worry about getting their families and without, breeded. Yeah. No. So if you want to preserve the legacy, allow all the weed nerds to have whatever plant count they want. Yeah. Like if you're not selling it and you want to have 500 plants in your garage, let them. If you want to do a big seed pop and hunt for rare traits you're after and try to create a new strain, let them. You know, you can still make rules where like you're not allowed to send this out of state or we don't want you to sell it or, you know, we don't want you to this or that. But, you know, failing that, it's like if they if they want preservation of genetics, they should make rules that allow legally you to do that. And it doesn't have to have this super taxed, super regulated commercial only legality, because that's essentially what they've done is they're like, if. You know, it's only legal if you're commercially paying them. Like, I think a private farmer right now can have like four or six plants or something. That's called a shakedown. Yeah. That's not, that's not, that's not saving moms that you care about. That's yeah. not popping a bunch of seeds and doing a pheno hunt. That's not no. saving things impossible. from the pheno hunt. That's not being like, oh, I just popped, you know, 50 seeds of riots, you know, whatever hybrid, you know, strawberry mm -hmm. switchblade. Yeah. And there's 10 of them I like that I want to run again and compare them. There's no doing that anymore. That's that illegal. Point. Even if you want to do yep. that in a, in a four by eight tent. Yeah. In a two and by two space, you couldn't do And you're it. growing them little popsicles. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. not legal. It's yeah. preposterous. So the biggest thing that they could do for legacy is let all the weed nerds and let all the preservationists and let all the people that have all that stuff, give them the freedom to play around with weed non-commercially yeah which is what every I other agree. vegetable and fruit can do yeah as long as they make it it's only legal if you want to have this extremely expensive to maintain and set up business there's a lot of non-commercial cannabis that might have value later on that we don't even know about yeah there could be cancer curing compounds there could be there could be ones that are better for glaucoma there could be ones that are better for nausea or HIV or this or that or whatever. Or I just don't you know. even think that's anybody's concern except maybe the the PhD academics that are looking into it. But I don't think they again. There's that disconnect of these middlemen that have made this big wall between the two. But if you allow us to preserve legally, then we'll do it. And the PhDs and all the testing and all that, that can happen later because we'll, we're already doing it for ourselves. I, they're just so bad at letting, uh, taking something, the government taking something and then being like, all right, you're right. You know, let's give it back. Like well, that, if, that if, just, if you want, it doesn't happen. All right. So if you want me to be like real political, like going back to overgrow, Right. Which was mm -hmm. overgrowing cannabis world were the first two really big forums where people that didn't know each other could gather and talk about weed. Right. Yeah. And the whole overgrow concept was literally if everyone over if everyone grows, we're going to overgrow the government's ability to criminalize all of us and they'll have to, to change police it. it. Yeah. Yeah. 
like like if there's enough civil disobedience going on where we're like this law sucks right and enough people yeah. do it they can't jail the entire population they can't even jail most of the population they can only jail a tiny fraction yeah right and so you know like i don't think the fight has is over at all like no, my whole I don't life, think it's over. My whole life, they've been like, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you can't have it, you're evil for having it, you're a scumbag, no, you're bad, stop. And now they're like, hey, this thing you got, it's pretty cool. If you want, yeah. we'll take it from here. If you want to give us all your knowledge mm -hmm. and all your strains and all your seeds and all that and let us you and let us commercially you we'll take you did a good job. You're good. You'll we'll take it from here. Yeah. And so I think I don't think the fight is over. I think the fight has changed and that they're losing. And so they're finally starting to give us medical and recreational at a wide scale. I guess I guess for my again, my point of view being very the punk rock kind of point of view, it's like I didn't give a shit what they thought then when it was illegal, and I don't give a shit what they think now when it's legal. Right. However, this but is what then, you gotta re this is what you gotta realize though, man. Yeah. Is that when they didn't want us to have it at all, that made it a lot more lucrative. Yes. And as such that it was lucrative, it allowed us to fund our insurgency, if you will. That is true. Yeah. Right. It allowed us to fund seed making, clone, clone saving, clone sharing. You know, yeah, we were, was, yeah. it allowed yeah. us to fund our punk rock side of things. Absolutely. Right. So your fear that you talked about before is that, you know, they crash the price so much that the people that are trying to enact change can't self fund. Correct. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, take it from like, obviously, like the, the weed fight that we're doing is totally nonviolent. But mm -hmm. I often wonder, like when the American government was in Afghanistan, like, would we have would we have beaten the Taliban if the Taliban didn't have hashish and opium to fund their operations yeah who knows you know yeah um you know in the sense that like you know they were able to get you know they at some point i can't remember when but it was like i read this thing where like you know we were three four years into the into the fight over there and they were like afghanistan is producing 90 percent of the world's heroin mm-hmm well, that obviously, who was I'm, who was making that money? Our yeah. government, usually. But I just mean that, like, <laughs> it, it, it allowed those, like, you know, like a resistance movement has to have some level of funding. Yeah, as I understood it, it was uh, the Taliban trying to clear it out because they were religious fundamentalists and us protecting it. As best I, remember. I mean, who knows what went on over there? I definitely think that you know, they might, I don't know if they're clearing it out again, but it's like any kind of movement needs something to fund itself. So we, maybe it was yeah. a bad analogy or whatever, but they were able to, I mean, they were able to use the hash trade and weed, or maybe they weren't even all that involved in it and they just took protection money. Yeah. I'm sure that was going on. Yeah. From the farmers and the dealers and the people that needed to use the trade routes or whatever else. Yeah. And so, you know, in the 215 era and in the illegal era, it was much smaller, but it was also much more profitable. And so if you stayed hidden, you could kind of do what you wanted. Yeah. Now I think they're trying to trick us by being like, okay, we'll give you what you want, but it's only kind of what you want. And it's basically us taking most of what you want, but mm -hmm. we'll take away some of the fear of you getting in trouble. And in yeah. return, you'll give up your hope. Yeah. And yeah. Allow us to just, you know, to just take this over from you. Yeah. And so we got the growing side. We'll let you smoke, but we got the we got the we got the back side. You can smoke. Yeah, and so to me, it's like until I'm able to grow weed in my backyard, like I'm able to grow cucumbers or tomatoes or whatever, like think about before Whole Foods and before the 20 years ago when like the the organic revolution really like took hold in America and got like more mainstream. Like all the people doing all those heirloom vegetables and, and fruits and stuff were all a bunch of crunchy hippies. Yeah. And back to nature were, types yeah. and weird little farmers and stuff. Most people didn't yeah. even know that was going on. And little co-ops. Yeah. There was little co-ops. There was little things going on. There was small groups of enthusiasts 
that kept all that stuff alive until big companies were like, oh, people want this? Okay, we'll carry some. Yeah. Right? But we, in order for weed to have that happen, they need to allow the enthusiasts. They need to allow the people with passion. They need to be allow the people with a, a touch of the tism, you know, who get into it like that <laughs> deeply and care that deeply right? about lineage and strains and history and old things to preserve it. How do you see that happening? That's how I, that's, that's what I just said. I, I think that we need to go from like a, a, uh, we need to make it actually legal. How is, I mean, how do we get lobbyists? I mean, that's how people get things legal. I mean, how do, how do people like us, the, the strain nerds, how do we assemble? Well, to, we're in a to dark be able to time. We're, power. We're in a dark time in the moment because they changed all the rules on us by partially yeah. giving us what we wanted. Yes. And now everyone's realizing that, that was a little bit of like fool's gold. Right. And where do we go from here? Yeah. And so probably what it's going to take is what I think is going to happen is, is they're not going to, they're not going to really start to look at changing all the rules and regulations until, um, until the states start failing and get embarrassed. Yeah, I can see that. Like I've, I've consulted on some pretty big projects here and there. And like, when I talk to people in big ag, yeah, they just can't believe the rules and regulations and bullshit that we have to jump through. Oh yeah. They're used yeah, to being able a at a large level to cowboy up and kind of do what they want with wide choices and latitude and it's all yeah. based on being efficient and having good production models and this and that. But the hand of the government is pretty light, yeah. you know, and you know, that's what we need is we need a light hand right now. We have a heavy hand, you know, and there's people that are trying to steal it from us. And there's people in our community that are banding with them, hoping to help them steal it from us, but to get yeah. personally wealthy along the way yeah, and make sure. it for them and their family. And all those people need to get mostly screwed. Yeah, it'd be nice you know? if they did, but yeah. A lot of them are. I mean, let's let's put it this way, right? Like It is true, yeah. I mean, you know, you could talk about, uh, you know, there's that, there's, uh, let, let's put it this way. We don't need to name who, right? <laughs> who is he, who's he thinking about? Yeah. Would you want to be sued by Scots? Oh, no. No, fear no. Like a massive corporation with endless money and probably lawyers that are five hundred dollars an hour, would you Good want Lord them no. to come after you? They win. They win suits where they're. They sound like they're the devil and they win the suits. Yeah. yeah so, so that's what I'm, and so some of the some of these rich investors are like, you know, you know what Bernie Madoff's problem was? He stole from other rich people. Yeah. And when Big they figured problem. it out, they were like, oh no. No, 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 yeah. no, no. I'm going to call up my $500 an hour lawyer, you know, and I'm going to get his yeah. law firm, you know, and then, you know, you get dozens of people doing this. That's what's going to happen with a bunch of these investors when they find out that they poured their money down the toilet. Oh, yeah. It's gonna and be they found ugly. out that a bunch of, a, a bunch of like non-ethical hustlers were sloshing their money around and not really treating it the right way. But do you think, you know, so do you think there's a chance that that any kind of major corporation predicted that this is what would happen? Because I, in my opinion, I don't think that this is that out of the realm of logic for all having taken place, like from watching how alcohol became what it was to now and stuff and how many people ripped it off and got in the middle between the, the gray areas and stuff. Alcohol is a totally different. Alcohol is a totally different it scenario. Is. It is a totally different scenario. But look at all the the dirty middlemen in between, and how many people that were like actually outlaws doing it got screwed in the end. That's the whole scenario. And now it's a well. Commodity. I mean, you can kind of say they got screwed, but like if you want to, I mean, this is getting really off track. But if you want to look at alcohol, the reason why alcohol got made illegal, if you can look it up, was because before prohibition. Like Americans were the, was the drunkest country on earth. 
right? There was men drinking gallons upon gallons of whiskey. There was mass like absences on Mondays on the work week because people were so hung over from the, from, from the weekend. Yeah. Right. The abolitionists, the prohibitionists, the reason why they were so against it was because the level of public drunkenness, like if you just type into Google, like how much they drank then versus today, it's yeah. astronomical. Right. And the reason they got rid of it wasn't because they made a big mistake. It was because they were like, oh man, like we fueled these criminal groups to where they've taken over almost every major city and they actually run the cops and they run the mayors and they're electing yeah. and they're doing this and they're doing that. And everyone's disobeying us, like everyone. And it's creating this horrific thing. And like after they got rid of prohibition, it took them an extra 50 or 60 years to break the mob. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking like Kennedy, like he, I was all the way up into 63 that, and he was alcohol prohibition, like bootleg. Well, his type. dad, he was not, having, not him. That, yeah. That's what I'm saying. But he had political effect all the way up until 63 to get his sons elected. Oh, and there's, like, there's almost yeah. no doubt that the, I mean, that the Chicago mob helped Kennedy get elected and helped him oh, win yeah. Illinois. Um, and you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to like, you know, divert on a tangent, but like weed, weed has not like alcohol fueled so much money that it corrupted so many police forces, so much government, so many mayors, so many senators, so many different things that they almost, in order to restore order, they had to stop it. It was like a massive failure. And it, cannabis, yeah, they didn't stop it. Cannabis, you know, there's not like cannabis, like, you know, criminal groups or whatever that like own mayors that own the police forces that are like, there's not enough money sloshing around. That's true. No, there's just not there that, you know I mean? Like they said like Al Capone or something like that, you know, he's worth like, you know, $700 million in but today's money or something. It's, but looking at it just strictly from a business model, it was very easy to predict how it was going to go. There was going to be people who thought they were rich enough to play. And then there were going to be the actual rich people who could take loss that had way more money than the people that thought they were rich here and Somewhat. could take the losses longer and play the longer game because that's, but honestly, that's economics. I, you know, like I've consulted for people that I think are incredibly rich at times. And yeah. like in order for those incredibly rich people to, you still have to realize that like they invest their money in so many different things that like cannabis has to be as good or better than other places they could put their money. Oh, sure. And yeah, what they're discovering course. is that cannabis is actually quite a bit worse yeah. than most other places they could put their money. So cannabis might have extracted a ton of investment out of all these different types of people. But yeah. eventually there's the situation where like you've been losing money for four or five years and you're like, oh, I thought that, you know, profit would be around the corner. And if it's not, you might just cut bait and start putting that money you were pouring into it into you know, into something that's going to make you money right away. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Like, it's economics. It, so, these guys outlast these guys. Right, but I don't think there's... And they I predict mean, I, that. I, I think they there's people that are trying to outlast others, but I think that there's a lot of losers that thought they would be in the outlast category. Well, yeah, that's, again, that's economics. The guys that fall out never think they're going to be the ones that fall out. They always think they're the richest in the house. That are going to be the guys that are the smartest. It's almost like, I mean, I could do it. I could do it. But the thing is, is that like looking at like that, like there's like, you know, New York just opened up mm -hmm. and New York has like five stores open yeah. and they're trying to like build this, this legal industry. And there's all these news reports now of like, you know, hundreds of bodegas illegally selling cannabis that they know is from California. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And they're like, how in the hell are we going to stop this thing? You know, it's like they don't they don't get that. Like one of the things that alcohol did that was vastly different than cannabis is that mm -hmm. alcohol was made legal at the federal level when they repealed the amendment. So all 50 states oh, yeah, made it legal. Right. right. And that there, there were certain counties and there were certain places that are still dry to this day in Arkansas and, you know, there's Missouri. There's some places in the deep south that are still dry counties and you can't buy alcohol. But right now, as long as there's legal counties, not legal counties, 
legal states, not legal states, it's going to be chaos and they won't be able to control it. Yeah. They just won't. Sure. I mean, look at Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma used to be one of the worst places to get caught with cannabis in the entire United States. You used to be able to read <laughs> in high times that people got caught with like 12 plants and got 50 years. Yeah. Right? Like it used to be incredibly severe and then they're pretty Republican. And so they're like, okay, we're just going to like make it legal and we're going to have almost no government regulation. Right? Yeah. And then they do that for a few years and then they realize that like most of the grows are cartel or Chinese nationals <laughs> and they're using, and they're using Oklahoma as a base to supply all the illegal states in the Southern part of Southeastern part of the United States and Texas. Yeah. And they're like, what the hell? Yeah. There's only 4 million people in Oklahoma. Yeah. But they allowed I mean like 3000 acres to supply like 4 million people. Yeah. And then they're shocked at diversion. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know? So, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the fight right now is the people that care are, are hurting because the game has changed and it's hard to adapt to change that happens really quickly. And so the parts that Matt and I care about are, you know, I mean, we're for the small guy. You know, we want, we want, we want as much experimentation as possible. We want people to be able to like, you know, pursue their little dreams or their little interests. And, you know, if you want to start a small company, you want to start a small business, it shouldn't take millions of dollars of outside capital. Yeah. Just to get a small one up and running and going. I didn't, I think the first thing that really shocked me when I, when I talked to the very first person that went from you know, traditional market to, to legal was how much money it costs just to get the equipment for the, for the government to surveil you via metric. Oh yeah. And I mean, to, I was like, you have to pay all this money just for them to, to, to snitch on There's, you? there's farms in Santa Barbara that have to pay 800 to a million dollars or more just for their licenses every year. Yeah. It's insane. Just for a 10,000 square foot license, which is the size of a, you know, basically a football field. I go back to my Robin Hood comment. I mean, just it, it's base logic. It's all bad. We know it as at our heart. We know we shouldn't be getting shut down like that. You know, so as kids. honestly, what would happen is if you if you what I think would happen is that if they actually made a metric that worked and they mm -hmm. drew like a big bright line where legal couldn't get diverted at all. I think 80 to 90, I think 80 percent of the farms in the state would fail. Yeah. And it would be mostly the big farms. Yeah. Because they would be unsustainable. And it would be the yeah. small smaller farms that are more that are more nimble, that are better at growing, that could produce a better quality product that would honestly probably survive. You know, I used to think that it would be a couple big farms smushing everybody out. I actually don't think without exportation to other states or other areas that's actually feasible. I think most of those things would fail. You lived. You live in an area where there is a demand for crafts still, where there is a quantity of smokers that do care about quality and no quality in the first place to care about quality. But if you're in one of these many other cities that aren't one of the meccas of cannabis, it wasn't like that. A lot of people have never seen quality in the first place to know quality. Oh, I get it. I wouldn't get it. I just think that like a small it's family so optimistic. I just, my, I'm not, I don't think I'm optimistic. I just God think damn that, you're optimistic. I just think that all these big, big farms are surviving on fresh investment and diversion. Uh, yeah, I agree. Because, you know, like, I, I mean, I remember, I'm not going to call it who it is because it's unimportant, but I was consulting on something and they had like a, they had a pretty good sized farm down South. And one of their sales guys came to me all panicked and he was like, Hey, I just, I just, I got all the, for all the legal sales for all the dispensaries. And I was like, okay. And he's like, this is really weird. And I'm like, what's weird. He's like, if we hit the numbers you say we can hit, we could supply 90% of the state in yeah. sales. He's like, where is it all going? And I was good like, question. Oh, you're starting to figure it out, huh? Yeah, good question. You know, and so, 
as a result, it's like, I think, I think without exportation, I think all of these huge farms would implode underneath their own weight. Yeah. You know, I think they would. And, you know, the difference between the small family farms up by me and the, the big farms down there is the big farms down there are all funded by rich people that can just divert their money and go do something else. That's and true. the small so farm and the, out. and the small farms up in Humboldt and Mendo and these different spots, like the people up here have no other choice. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's, there's all, no, and, there's and no the choice. You're already happening. It's already happened. It's not oh, like it's we already can happening. The tape. We can't rewind you the know? tape on what we've lost and the families that have lost stuff. And, yeah. But it also, it also boomed during 215. There was a lot, I don't want to call it anybody out again but there was a lot of rich kids that came up here and bought properties with their family money and then hired one of their buddies to run it after a year or two and then ended yeah. up living in santa rosa or the bay or la or wherever and just taking a percentage because they owned the land that their <laughs> parents yeah. bought them yeah you know there was a lot of there was a lot of out of town people that bought property up here you know, because it just funded their Burning Man lifestyle or it funded their Hawaii or it funded their this or that. It gave them a bunch of free time. It's like, imagine you could set up a scene and you're like, okay, I'll hire you to run my spot, but I get yeah. it. It's a 50 I'm going to go split. get these neck tattoos while you do all this work. You're going to do all this work, but yeah. I provide the spot, you know, and you can't afford the spot, but I can because my parents bought it. Yeah. Because they have good credit and they put down the down payment. That's very typical though. You know? Yeah. It's very typical. People don't want to. People don't want to admit it, but there was a bunch of people. They're all. They're all fleeing the county now, yeah. Because their business model failed. They can't give a percentage for nothing. Yeah. You know, but there was and there was a lot of middlemen too that were making a lot of money not doing very much. But I'm just saying the people that are actually willing to like work work their spot. Yeah. You know. Um, because I think what ha what would happen is is like imagine imagine you have a 40 acre farm. You know, that could be, that could be 41 acre farms or that could be yeah. 160, 10,000 square foot farms. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and those little farms, you know, it's, it's, it's just like, what do you think better weed comes out of a four lighter or a four or 500 lighter? Yeah. I smaller mean, yeah. Is, smaller is generally better. There's like, there is like a size at which you're not going to be able to get, um, craft anymore nobody wants to agree what that size is because everybody wants to call whatever project they're on craft yeah you know of course but let's just face it it's like eventually it's too big and you're having hired help that aren't as good as you care for most of your plants yeah it's the way it works you know so i don't i mean i'm not even trying to be all that hopeful because it's it's a very stressful time and i worry that even if like I managed to survive mm -hmm. or not me or, you know, various people up in my area managed to survive. Most won't. I don't under think the it's possible to under the current, under the current situation. And then, and then as a result of that, my community falls into poverty again. And with that goes the legacy strains. And, and that's, and, that's why I said, like, when I saw that article to me, like, it's just like, you are, a year and a half too late to even be trying to, I mean, granted, there are a lot of things left that, that haven't been lost that are in libraries. There are still people keeping these. Not everything is lost, but there are so like, if they gave any shits about legacy, anything, they would have been doing this from the jump. I don't think they know? realized. I don't think and the other really part of it too, care. is that, even if even if they do have all this money and even if like these even if these like various colleges or whatever are going to start doing it does that mean that these like small you know preservationists or whatever are going to like give over their legacy stuff to these researchers we already know what's going to happen because we saw it happen in thailand is it just is that just a way for wealthy people to collect all the because the thing is is that wealthy people have everything that we don't yes. except for the knowledge of how to do a good job, the, the connections within the community and the strains and, and what's real and what's not.
Yes. They can get all the permits. They can hire the construction companies. They can get the lawyers. They can get lot. They can do all that. They just, but when it comes to actually growing it, processing it, trimming it, putting good weed in the bag, and then knowing what the differences are, they have no idea. So in a lot of states I mean, that have gone legal, they want to hire people to teach them and they want to get the strains and then they want to fire them. Yeah. That's, after that's they have, they did after they, yeah. after they have the strains and after they have the SOPs and after they have the know-how, they're like, Oh, I don't need you anymore. So my biggest fear with the legacy study is you could say, Oh, it's too little too late. They should have done this a while ago. But like, what does that money go to? What are they going to study? That's what I'm trying to tell you. Like in, in, we've already seen what, what happens with this. I like to me, it's obvious what's going on because they just did this in the Philippines. Is like, it another Phylos or Thailand? I'm sorry, Thailand. No, I mean like over in Thailand, they they have they have a lady there, as I understand it, allegedly not very well tied in by what she's saying in representing as as history of Thai strains, which are really grown by Laotian communities in Thailand. You know, um, they now have like four or five like land race legacy strains that you could come get and get in Thailand only as, you know, like, and they use it like a, a, a freaking a shopping thing, like a marketing ploy. And that's what I, like, we know, like it, in my mind, in my heart, I know where they're going with it. I should say, I shouldn't say we know, I think I know where they're going with it because we see, we see the shit all the time. Like, we saw people go to Oklahoma and all the same people going to Oklahoma are now in Thailand. It's like how many, it just, everything mimics each other. They cared about legacy strains in Thailand. It was a big deal. It made international news, real international news. And all of a sudden they want to fund this thing for legacy strains in here. People got mad at me about Oklahoma or whatever. And, um, I have some, I have some prejudices against it because, uh, someone I knew pretty well got in prison there for a very long time in the grateful dead era for weed. Um, but you know, Matt and I used to joke a little bit that like every disreputable character in cannabis, like, like, like fell upon Oklahoma as the great new hope, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that's kind of what, like what people are chasing is they're bouncing around to a new state and being like, maybe I can get three to five years out of it before, the compression hits and I can make money and I can bounce around. Oh, and there's opportunity here. Oh, there's opportunity there. Oh, there's opportunity over here. And maybe there's a window where I can succeed before all these things I know are going to hit, hit. And then I can bounce to the next. I just see like, like this be the opportunity. And I'm going to say this specifically as an example, because it's something that couldn't possibly happen because it's, it's going on in Canada, but like an opportunity for someone like, uh, the bull rider strain that they really have nothing to do with at all. And like, oh, this is a legacy strain. Hey, perfect time to market these two. Bam. Come get your bull rider at the fucking, you know, like, and, and nothing has anything to do with anything in the first place. And all the real legacy growers that have this stuff are like, cha, cha, cha. Yeah, sure. And all course. the scientists I mean, are studying that because they're like, hey, you know, and they're the ones I'm, who write the history books. Again, we won't name names, but like some of the same people that like ran towards the money first when, you know, when in 2017 and 2018, when this thing started kicking off, there are probably going to be the people, if there's money involved, there'll probably be the people running towards the end and being like, I can help you with legacy. Yeah, I know everybody. Course. I've got the whole deal. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've got a huge collection. You can here, you pay me this amount, yeah. and I'll grab these things for you. And it's like I don't, I like I don't care. You're gonna pay me, so that's fine. Yeah. And by the yeah. time you figure out, I haven't given you what you're supposed to get. Who cares? Yep. And and for any of those people, like perspective uh, people that are in those positions to be hiring these people, if you see in these people's past resumes, like. Colorado, Thailand, and like all this movement through the cannabis states as they go, probably double think it. That's that's my best advice I could give you. Just double think it. Double double inter do a second interview. Give second interviews, two interviews for that guy. I used to have I used to have this like running joke with friends that like my consultation thing would be yeah. that I would sit next to people and I would listen to the person pitch you and then I would talk to them and then I would tell you if they were full of shit or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great way I'd to be do like, it. You, you can't tell. I can tell. Yeah, yeah. 
I'll be able to tell, yeah. you know? And because it's like one of those things, like you and I know, like you can only, you can fake the talk to people that know nothing. Yes. But you sit down in a room with like me or you like, not just like, I'm not trying to put myself on some pedestal, but I'm just saying you sit down with someone that's been a, a in weed for their entire life and in these various circles and in these various groups and knows a lot. Yeah. You can either talk the talk or you can't. Yeah. And, and, and the, the thing that, again, I, I emphasize this almost on every episode, like it, it, it used to be more clear to everyone that these people that would sell these people on these ideas that they, hey, I've got this rare, rare cut. It was really easy to then for a person to go, hey, there's X amount of people with this cut. Is this guy, does this guy have this cut? He doesn't. Okay, he's a liar. Let's boot him out. It's very hard to do that. And for some reason, like I said, the disconnect's gotten further and further and further. And we need to try to seal that up somehow. And hopefully it's one of those things watch. where it's one of those things where like if you in the normal world, let's say that like you want to hire an accountant, you can go look at their resume and you can see that they went to school for this. They got accredited yeah. by that. They passed this test or this board. They're actually like a bonded or licensed the thing about like even being a contractor with a contractor license, yeah, you know, and a bond where like they have insurance in case they mess up your, your house or something. Right. Yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing like that trade style or accreditation style yet with candidates because we all come out of the shadows. Yeah. I mean, you have bring so your syndicate one. Boom. So right everybody, there. everybody can just be like, I, I'm good at talking and faking it. Yeah. No, for real. Uh, yeah, that's how it goes, you know, and a, a, a lot of the times when I've been, you know, when I've tried to consult for people, one of the most frustrating things is you give them good advice and they don't want to listen to it. No, I mean, yeah, or they, like, or they, yeah, or they don't know who to listen to or they're getting conflicting advice and they don't have the intelligence, they, not the intelligence. That's the wrong word. They don't have the knowledge of the scene they're in Yeah, to know which advice is better. Yeah, and cannabis is super hard to do research in. Yeah, really I almost said intelligence, season. but intelligence isn't the right word because they could be super intelligent and knowledgeable about other exactly. areas. Yeah, exactly. They're just they're just ignorant about weed, and yeah. that ignorance get used against them because then it it's, it goes into like, well, who sounds good? Yeah, you know, who puts himself forward the most? Who raises their hands exactly. the loudest and has the best marketing? You know what I mean? Who has it? You know. And most of the work. people that ran towards the money first in 2018, 2019, they were like, we want to get rich. We're going to go sell our story. Yeah. And a lot of those people ended up bouncing around because it ends up, they, they sell their story, but then a year, year and a half, two years into it, they get fired because they weren't able to deliver. I mean, I've seen projects that are on like their fifth management group in six years. That's so wild. Because and that's like they fire people because they they're like oh this these people aren't it yeah and then they hire more people that aren't it because they don't have a framework for how to for how to tell yeah okay um yeah so that's that's it for this week um sorry for such an abrupt ending we have power issues and glitches galore so yeah that's it from us again thank you so much thank you for listening thank you for your time. You can join us and chat with Matt and I more on subjects you may or may not care about when it comes to cannabis. We have a breeders discord that uh, breeder syndicate discord that started pretty small and has been gaining steam. Um, oh it's where a lot it's where a lot of people are chatting about a wide variety of subjects. Matt and I are both pretty active on there, and it's a way to connect um and uh with like-minded folks um and that's basically all it is so if you want to find a little community uh to chat about your interests and uh, uh that's it's we're a pretty good place yeah. so look us up matt does usually does the pitch but it's breeder syndicate 2.0 that works that works and again works, thank you yeah. for your time and uh we'll see y'all soon peace all right perfect dude that was good yeah i'm down to like six percent on my phone i could tell you're, the, you're uh, the, petering out the 40 minutes of fucking around and fucking getting kicked off and back and forth fucking sucking <laughs> my juice <laughs> you you really should admire i had so much restraint want to sit at the table with the syndicate check out our patreon and our link tree or description below our merch site is officially live 
We have all sorts of shirts, hoodies, and goodies to sort you out, and shipping is super fast, and most importantly, the quality is top notch. I've been saving old designs for years for this purpose, so please check it out, syndicategear.com. We also have an underground syndicate discord where we get together and solve old strain history together daily. It's an amazing community of learning away from IG, and it's an amazing resource for old catalogs and knowledge. We hope you join our union of breeders and growers. Come check it out.